that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. So lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and the famous Tom Fennell. And um, for those of you who have never seen this show before, and I'm sure there's very few of you, because not that many new readers watch this, <laughs> new, new viewers. Um, Some of the new guinea just signed up. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, every day I get up early. Today I got up at about 3.15. Ah, too early. But I spend a few hours looking at the internet to see what I can find in the way of news on energy and climate change. And when I find a, an article in the news that I think is interesting, I package it up in a 50 or 55 word synopsis with a link to the original article, put 10 or 15 those, of those together for the day, and post them at my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y. The um, Blog has a calendar in the upper left. If you click on a date in the calendar, it'll give you the blog entries for that date. And I try to remember to read the dates on the um, articles as we change dates. So we're starting with December 15th. In well, I just one. wanted to mention that uh, we don't have time to really delve into some of these articles. Yeah. And some of them are very informative and comprehensive. Well, did you, you saw the chart on on um, the levelized cost of electricity. Yeah. We're going to be talking about that one, I think. Okay, I don't have a copy of that. I, I, I have a copy on this machine. We can put it up so everybody we'll can see it. We can talk. Okay. But there's one of them we'll run in toward the end that's, uh, I think it's the very last item about the Connecticut turbine. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it, that is such a great website. It's got hundreds of, I'm exaggerating, pictures in a video, and yeah. it's, it's really fun it's, to watch. It's to look fun, at that and one. the Archimedes screw turbine is just fun. Yeah, it's yeah. just fun. A two thousand year old invention <laughs> that hasn't got. And found. you know, the funny thing about it is, fish go through that. Yeah, they just go through it. They don't even know it's there. They don't even know it's there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they can go through it in one direction. They can go through it going the the direction that the thing is turning. Uh huh. But not the other going, way. Going they can't back go back. They can't. So if the, if you're getting power from it, they will go downstream. If you're using it as a pump, instead of a generating turbine, they will go upstream. But I don't think this is designed to do that. But it's not designed it to. Be. It could be. Yeah. <laughs> well, and let's move on. Yeah, they they use those things in in fish hatcheries to move fish, not as turbines, but as pumps to move. Well, they've been using they them are, in, in Egypt to irrigate fields for two thousand years. Yeah. But and in the, Egypt, they, 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 they do it by, hand, by foot. Oh, yeah. Well, the it's reason like they're used... It's a bicycle before a bicycle was invented. The reason <laughs> they're used in fish, fish hatcheries is because they don't do any damage to the fry. Yeah, right. Really amazing. Okay, so we're starting on December 15th with a piece from Clean Technica. Shell Consortium sets new lowest offshore wind price. They just keep dropping. It just keeps dropping. The price <laughs> of electricity from offshore wind keeps dropping. A consortium made up of Shell, Mitsubishi, DGE, Van Ord, and Eneco has won a concession to build the Borsella 3 and 4 wind farms amounting to 700 megawatts at a record uh, low price of 54 um, euros and 50 cents, which is 5.7 uh, cents per kilowatt hour in, a, in American money. Only last July, the record low was 72.70 euros as opposed to 54. That's a significant. That's a big drop. And a lot of that is because of new uh, software, new designs in, in... There's a lot of things happening. Yeah. A lot of things happening. One of the biggest things that I got from this article, it's the, they call it the industrialization of the offshore wind supply chain. Right. You know, they got these special machines, special ships now that are built. They we'll, certainly we'll see a have, picture of yeah, one we'll, of them. We've talked about them before. They're amazing. Yeah, they are. Um, so, as, this, as the article says, the race for, off, for the lowest offshore wind bids has been fierce this year. Yeah, it has been, and it, it's going to continue. Our next item is from vtdigger.org. Yeah, we're back home. We have a, a picture Let's get here. This picture up. Yep. And Tom, leave this picture up because I'm going to be switching from this to another picture while we're talking. This is a map of Vermont, obviously. 
<coughs> and so it's this is a from, little bit hard to see, unfortunately. That's why I've got a second picture. Oh, okay, good, okay. good. Uh, I wanted to put up a map of the entire state so people could see the context, the ge geographical context of the second map, which shows the middle of the state. And uh, what's the title on this? Mega International Power Transmission Line wins federal approval. Okay. So what they're doing is they're buying power from Hydro-Quebec. Right. And bringing it down <coughs> right into Ludlow, where it joins the grid, and it goes north, south, east, and west from there. There you go. And from Ludlow to here, really, by Yankee, there's two huge transmission lines. Right. 345 kV. But this one is no slouch. This is 1,000 kV DC. Wow. The DOE gave its approval this week to an international power line to carry 1,000 megawatts from Canada to southern New England. The electricity will come mainly from Canadian hydroelectric dams, but it will also include some power from wind turbines in New York State. The state of Vermont will have dibs on 200 megawatts of it. Now, I'm going to switch this. Which is not much. I mean, it's 1,000 megawatts, but we're getting 200. Two, well, 200 megawatts is For almost, us, is good. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit less than we used to buy from Vermont Yankee. About half. So, no, it's, we only bought a, th uh, uh, a third of the power Vermont Yankee made. Okay. So, okay. so I, this is I, close, I, to, yeah. close to the full amount. There is a picture of, uh, that, is, that shows this in a little better detail. You can see the kind of green line, uh, wavy line, I mean green, blue wavy line coming down on the left side of the state there, which is that Plus very... That's submerged cable. It's underneath the lake. Yeah, that's right. That's brilliant. Yeah. And by the <coughs> way, I noticed this. It follows exactly the state line. Well, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, when they really put it down there, who knows? But. Who knows? But that's, um, that's the very narrow section of uh, Lake Champlain. All the way down the bottom. It's All the way down the bottom, yep. And uh, then it goes across. Um, I think it goes on a highway. On a highway? Uh, yeah, I think so. Really? I think to, it goes on state roads. To Ludlow. Yeah. So yeah. that's where it is. Ludlow, of course, is in Windsor County, which is the next county north of Wyndham County. And everybody who's watching this show should know that Wyndham County is where we we, uh, the, the original broadcasts of Energy Week are. Well, so of course. <laughs> if you happen to be that person watching this show in New Guinea, now you've got an explanation. Okay? So there's a little takeaway here. The $1.2 billion project will carry roughly the same amount of power Vermont consumes as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something. You know, this is interesting, too. This is a 1,000-megawatt a project costing... 1.2 billion dollars, but it's just transmitting electricity, <coughs> and that tells you something about how important um, distributed power is because you don't need those transmission lines for it. That's a good point. I mean, we're accustomed to thinking in terms of transmission. We are, but yeah. But the new paradigm is going to be <coughs> far less room for transmission. Right. We are up to December 16th, and this is from yeah, the Addison County, Vermont. Addison County Independent. That's a nice, nice picture there. <coughs> Sorry about my coughing. Middlebury College achieves carbon neutrality. Middlebury College has won an important battle in what resident scholar Bill McKibben recently asserted must become an all-out war on climate change. Late last week, the college announced it had achieved carbon neutrality, bringing its net carbon footprint to zero in response to a student challenge in 2007. And that picture is a picture of a 2,100-acre well, uh, uh, forest that the, or I mean, a, a large part of what's in the picture is a 21-acre, 2,100 acre That's about acre three forest. square miles, by the way. Yeah. That's a pretty good size it, it's forest. It's a good size thing, but those mountains in the distance are pretty far away. This is not all their forest preserve. No, it's mostly in the <coughs> green area where, right. where their campus is. It surrounds their campus. Yeah. And that um, they're using for sequestering carbon. I would, I would <coughs> suspect it's the dark green on the left of the map there. Okay. I, you know, it just looks like a, a forest. Well, <laughs> well, it's all forest, but that's softwood. That is softwood. That, that's, yeah. You know, I, no we've, we've talked about this before. Middlebury College 
is way in the front in, in doing innovative technology. You know, here. when I mentioned this to somebody in this last week, I mentioned Middlebury College had, had done this, and she said, well, Middlebury College is, is pushing for the, the uh, natural gas pipeline coming. Well, they are. Yeah. And, you know, there's a reason why they're pushing for that pipeline. Yeah, they, they get rid of oil. No, no, that's not why. The, the reason they're be, they pu are pushing for that pipeline that comes down from where? From, from well, it's uh, up north. Burlington. Yeah. Um, is because they've got, a, they've got contracts, for, contracts for biogas from a couple of biodigesters that are 20 miles north of them. Well, that's what I, that, that is replacing oil that they use. Oh, to yes. Eat, okay. Eat the, gotcha. The, the and that what they want to do is they want to take advantage of the pipeline that is in, uh, the yeah. fact that the pipeline's yeah. in place so they can inject um, biogas 20 miles away and then use it at, at the, the at college, campus. at the campus. Yeah. And by the way, I saw a statistic this last week. In the United States, about a year and a half ago, I saw that the Agriculture Department said we had about 275 biodigesters. <coughs> Pardon me. In the country, I have a little bit of a cold today. When you, can, <coughs> when you consider the enormous amount of cows <laughs> in America, yeah. there should be a lot more biodigesters. There are 14,000 of them in Europe. Biodigesters? Yes. Or cows? <laughs> 14,000 biodigesters. There's, there's probably about 300 in the United States. And, okay. and, and Vermont had 16. Vermont had 16 when California got its first one. Uh -huh. And it's not just cows, it's, it's all, sorts of all sorts of animals, chickens, swine, you name it. But it's also food waste and it's also human waste and it's just any of that. And it's a tremendous source of fuel that we are throwing away. That's right. As That's a matter of fact, it costs right. us money to throw it away. Yeah. And we can make money by, by using it um, to, to process in this manner because you get electricity and the byproduct is fertilizer. Can't, can't lose. <laughs> it, there's nothing, there's, yeah. It's just like nature. Nothing's wasted in nature. That's right. Okay. Something eats everything. Something <laughs> eats everything, including the rocks, by the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Our next item is from Tech Central. Solar, now the cheapest form of new electricity. This, is, this has been coming, but you know it came a little bit quicker than anybody expected. A transformation is happening in the global energy markets that is well worth noting as 2016 comes to an end. Solar power for the first time is becoming the least costly um, form of new electricity. Unsubsidized solar is beginning to outcompete coal and natural gas on a larger scale according to fresh data from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And um, I, I, want to, I want to bring up a thing here uh, where the pictures are. Just a sec. There we go. Uh -huh. This will show you. This is a chart um, that I, I sent to Tom, so he's seen it, but he doesn't have it on his machine over there. I hope, you, I hope people can read that. Um, this, is, this is what's happened. In, 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 this is according to Lazard. Uh, Lazard is probably the most quoted financial uh, analysts on the cost of energy, and they have a thing called the levelized cost of electricity. If which you do, is, which includes everything, it includes the subsidies that go yeah. in. So when everything. you see a price here, it is a price including the subsidy. And um, on this chart, you'll see that the the cost, the lowest in, uh, price in the in the chart is onshore wind, which is listed as $47 per megawatt hour on average. And um, the, the, uh, uh, what, what has happened here is, here is that Bloomberg says the price of utility scale solar has gone below that. But this average price is the average for the year. Okay. And if you want to do a search on this, it's L-A-Z-A-R-D, Lazard's Levelized Cost of Electricity. You can just put in L-C-O-E on a Google search. And then you want to make sure that it's version 10, because they do this every year. And version 10 was just released this week. This is what this story is about, in fact. You'll notice that combined cycle natural gas, which is the most efficient natural gas type of plant, yeah. with the single exception of reciprocating engines, in a, in a uh, situation where um, you have um, 
um, you're, you're taking the heat from the exhaust and using it for heating buildings and things you're like that. You're kind of scavenging that heat. You, yes, and there's a term for it, and it's just not in my mind right now. Um, combined cycle natural gas is $63, and ut utility-scale solar is, has, has gone down to a price which is below 47 at the end of the mm -hmm. year. The 51 mm -hmm. and 55 was the average for the year. I want to point out here, though, and this wasn't in this talked about. And I, I looked at many stories, and the only story that I know of that talks about this, which was right there in the middle of Lazard's data, is that next line that says utility scale PV with storage at an average price of $92. Because that's the price of PV with storage. Okay. That is the price of the best quality electricity we have. Have okay because it's instant. If you it's want the power, always there. it's it's just it's Flip always the there. And it comes on. Yes, it's always there, and it's there instantly. If you want, you know, this is you don't have to ramp up like to this. The nuclear and, and coal at the bottom of the near the bottom of the chart are both used because they just go. They chug along twenty four hours a day. You the have problem to either is leave them on all the time. Or wait two, three hours for them to, well, to ramp up. For, for a nuclear plant, it's, it's two or three days. Yeah. And actually, for a coal plant, it can, can be a couple of days. For natural gas combined cycle, it can be many minutes to hours. Yeah. And, and um, this is basically what we're, we're at a point now where the, you, the price of solar with storage is, is getting competitive with combined cycle natural gas. And it's getting com competitive with any kind of baseload power. And these are two areas where there's a lot of research being done. Yeah. Batteries and PV. And, the, and every time you turn around, somebody comes up with a lower price. That's right. <coughs> and the price of PV, I don't know how low the price of PV can go. But I can tell you one thing, and that is the price of battery storage is, is going down like a rock falling. Oh yeah, you know, and and it's not the only form of storage. It's Other not forms the of only storage form are, of storage, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, very innovative. Yeah. <laughs> okay, should we go on? I think we can. There's okay. A, there's a quick takeaway here: peak fossil fuel use for electricity. Yeah. Maybe reached within the next decade. Yes, I think it will be. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, our our um, next item is from Metro U.S. Massachusetts added thousands of clean energy jobs in 2016. This is impressive. Uh, Massachusetts has been a national leader for renewable, uh, for reliable power sources, such as po solar, wind, and water. According to the 2016 Massachusetts Clean Energy and Industry Report, early stage investments in clean energy companies in the state grew 166%. That is the growth Yep. That's the growth. It is 266% of what it was a year ago. Yep. <laughs> in, um, adding uh, more than 6,300 clean energy jobs in the year. And I should point out, clean energy jobs include a lot of things that are not producing energy, they're saving energy. Okay, yeah. Like weatherization. Weatherization, yeah. Right. yeah. Good. Uh, quick takeaway here. Massachusetts has shown that acting on climate change is good for the economy and the environment. Yes, there Good you statement. go. Good statement. Okay, our next item, and we already have the pictures up, picture so yeah, we can we just go. switch there. Um, this is uh, from the Omaha World Herald, and that is a picture of the Fort Calhoun nuclear plant in the middle of a flood. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about that a second because I looked it up on Google. Yeah. Closing Fort Calhoun nuclear plant helps the Omaha Public Power District avoid a rate hike, rate hike in 2017. This is impressive. Just think about this for a minute. Closing its lone nuclear power plant helped the Omaha Public Power District head off a rate hike that would have resulted in a bill increase of 2.5% for average residential rate pairs in 2017. The Utilities Board approved a recalculation based on closing the Fort Calhoun nuclear plant and adding 400 megawatts of wind power. Mm -hmm. Not coal, mm -hmm. not... not mm -hmm. Not well, they got natural a lot of gas. Wind. They've got a lot of wind out there. They do indeed. So. Uh, interesting that picture, that snaky looking thing in the middle of the of the picture there. That's the Missouri River. 
That's it, the Missouri River. Yeah, and on both sides of it is flooded fields. The ones on the left are actually in Iowa. Yep. And way in the back, you see what looks like another river. That's a lake. <laughs> <laughs> a U, big U-shaped lake. A big U-shaped lake. Interesting. Okay. Very interesting out there. This but is, this uh, really got, they got hit pretty bad with that flood. Well, they, it, it, it put the nuclear plant out of business for over a year. Looking at the picture, I, I don't have to wonder why. Yeah. Absolutely. This is a, this is a hard one. Um, and the next one is actually what that chart that we were just looking at is for. It's from Solar Industry, and this is the Elizard um, thing. Well, let's see. What, what does the article have to say? Or have you read it already? I haven't read that. I just We talked about the, the chart. <laughs> we talked about the chart when we were talking about Bloomberg. It's, it's re relevant for Bloomberg as well. So the, the headline covers it all. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's move on then. What's the headline? Didn't I, didn't I say No, you that? didn't, you didn't I, read I the headline. I did. I did read it. Closing Fort Calhoun Nuclear Oh, no, 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 no. Next one after Oh, the next that. one down. Oh, yep. I haven't read that one yet. No, 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 no. You're getting too much ahead of me. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. Uh, uh, costs of solar and energy storage kept dropping in 2016. Did I just say something yes, like that? Yes, you did. We were talking <laughs> about that chart. And I got to the chart a little ahead because we were talking about Bloomberg. Right, These right. were two different articles that both came out in the same week, and they were both basically saying the same thing. Lazard Limited's um, levelized cost of electricity analysis compares costs of various generation techniques. Its latest LCOE 10 shows the cost decline in generating electricity from solar PV is steeper uh, then decreases among other forms of renewable energy in 2016 with utility scale. Solar PV technology is down about 11% from last year. And you know, this is going to be something that's going to be very, very expensive to one particular very small group of people, which is um, about the, it's, it's about the, it's smaller than a hundred thousandth of 1% of the people in this. And that includes a couple of guys named named Coke and various people in Donald Trump's cabinet. This is they're at a, a very point, small number of people. They're at a point now where they are stuck between the rock and the hard place because they're going to have to go to the conservative Republicans who are saying they want the free market in operation, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to go and say, well, we want to pick who's going to win and who's going to lose. <laughs> and who's going to win, which is going to make America great, is obsolete technology. You know, let's bring back manual typewriters. Let's bring back... <laughs> <laughs> it will create more jobs, won't it? <laughs> if we brought back manual typewriters, yeah. it would definitely bring back <laughs> jobs, yes. There would be a lot of people who would, who would be professional protesters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move along. We got, yeah. a, we got a, another one that's going to take a lot of talk here, but this is a very significant article. Um, Climate change in the Arctic. Yes. Um, the US, let's get this picture up. Yeah, so let's get the picture up. And this picture, I wish I could have put up bigger as well. The, the uh, software that I'm using for uh, displaying these slides isn't sophisticated to really zero in on a small part. Um, U.S. Na uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has released its 2015 to 2016 Arctic Report Card. With sea ice extent and snow cover diminishing, it now appears that the Arctic is stuck in a set of feedback loops that will only see temperatures in the re region at ever fast rise at ever fasting rates for this foreseeable future. This is probably the single worst piece of news I have heard in the last several years. Well, there's a lot of hidden significance here. Yeah. This is, this is a lot more than just looking at a few hot spots in the Arctic. Okay. I mean, it's changing the climate of the Earth. Yes, it is. Because that... The Arctic is the, is the Earth's um, uh, air conditioner. Absolutely. And what this is saying... With the, with the ice gun, it can't act as well. That's right. What, this, what is happening here is the, the Arctic ice is melting. More and more of it melts every year. We've seen this over and over again on this show. When the ice melts and you've got open water, the sun's rays hit that water and they get absorbed. 
right. instead of being reflected away, as, as happens when you've got ice there. So the which water means gets hotter. the water gets hotter. Now, and more ice melts. More ice melts, and we, that is a feedback loop. Yep. And we've got another one coming up. I think, did we, did we have something about a, a glacier in Antarctica? Well, we talked about it last week, but we're going to talk about it later in this This, show. this is another serious yeah. thing. And what we're looking at here it's is a serious. situation where we might, within a period of months, and I'm not talking about months starting now, but from the time that, you know, the, the government says, by the way, we've got a serious problem here. From, the, from that time until, the, until cities get evacuated. I Which think, will happen. Yeah, I think it may be a, it may happen so quickly that people basically just pack their stuff and leave. And with luck, it means that they'll be able to pack all their belongings. Without luck, it means they're going to have to leave belongings behind. Because when you're trying to get everybody out of Miami, it's going to take time. How about New York? Uh, New York? Well, <laughs> what can I say? You can't get them all but, out. But the worst of it is it's going to be every city on every coast. So how do you get, how do you yeah. book a moving van when you when you if you know that when everybody wants one yeah if you know that you've got six months to get your goods out of Miami and you see that that you know you've got Galveston you've got uh, New Orleans you've got you know you just go up the coast every place you go well all Washington, of our DC. original cities were on the coast that's right and most of them still are yeah that's where the ships go that's that's why there's cities there. And unfortunately, what this says, this particular story says that with, the, with as much ocean, open ocean, the water is warmer. When the water is warmer, it's harder to freeze it in the winter, less freezes. That leaves um, more ice getting melted, smaller amount of ice the following year. And even if we stopped putting carbon um, emissions out altogether, we would still have go, uh, climate change going on for many, many years. So, well, if you look at that graph and you look at it very closely to the very right end, which covers the 21st right. century, yeah, you'll see that for the entire 21st century, the Arctic has been. Oh, I want to get it up. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> Here I am talking about. It. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> the the Arctic ice has been warming faster. Than the, than the, than rest the average, of the world. and the average is going up. Yeah, the average temperature is higher than it's ever been within human history, and the are and the in the Arctic it's going up worse. And if you, you know, the people who live in in uh, in Arctic areas have been telling the rest of the world about this for years and years and years, and there happens to be a group of people who have said, no, we're not going to listen to that because it isn't real. And the reason why they say it isn't real is because they're paid to say it isn't real because that's. You know, what is, really, <laughs> yeah. it's about money. It's about money. Yeah. You know, wh this is my opinion, my own opinion. Your own opinion. There is a very small group of people, four maybe, six, maybe it's a hundred, I don't know, yeah. but it's a very small group of yeah. people who are willing to put a lot of money, and I'm talking about over a billion dollars, into an American election in order to make sure that it comes out the way they want. Absolutely. And that group of people all made their money in related businesses. They're all related to fossil fuels. I was going to say So energy. they are putting in a, in a, a Congress and a, a person in the president, um, president's office, who, although they didn't get the person they wanted, they've, they've got people who are amenable to their who ways of want? thinking. They didn't want Donald Trump. No, but who do you, do you know who they wanted? I they wanted any of, any, any of the above any, list. Okay. You know. They had a long list of people that they want that they would say pick whoever you want, and they got Donald Trump because well, it's not a good, not, not going to happen in this show. But I got a list of what Ryan wants to do in Congress next year. Paul Ryan. Yeah. You it'll you if you read that list, you're going to lose sleep for two weeks. <laughs> I doubt it <laughs> because I know what these people are up to. It is I've not good. It. it is not good. You know. Some of the things on that list need to be. Looked at, yeah, but most of them don't. They're affecting the lower end of the, of society. They're just throwing them to the wolves. Well, anyway, he's not going to touch Social Security, though. Not going to touch That's Social Security. Says, yeah. Well, 
I will believe something out of <laughs> Paul Ryan when Paul Ryan has done it. And even <laughs> then, I won't believe it. Seriously, we've got people, and this is not just Republicans, it's Republicans and Democrats who have sold out their... Um, integrity. Integrity. <laughs> yeah, really. Their patriotism is, has been marred by a situation where their, um, f their uh, financial debts exceed everything else. All right, let's get out of this mire. Yeah, okay? well, we've still got another guy to talk about. <laughs> this the is next Trump? one is about Trump. This is from Mother Jones. Mother Jones. Yeah. Trump hates renewable energy unless it's powering one of his hot new hotels. <laughs> In, in August 2010, one of Donald Trump's most exclusive new hotels, the Trump Soho in down, downtown Manhattan, which is an ugly building, I think, boasted it would invest in 100% clean power. Significantly, I'm sorry, specifically, it would purchase electricity from wind, which Donald Trump hates. <laughs> one, of the main, uh, one of the deal's main architects said the move to purchase wind energy was spearheaded by... Ivanka Trump, Donald Trump's daughter. Breath of fresh air, I think. Yeah. The only breath of fresh air. Well, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how it develops. We'll see how it develops. Now, we have a, we have a picture here. Oh, this is the next This, this is, the is next for the one. next one. I'm just wondering, was one. there anything else no, that, to talk that, about that's, there? I think that's enough of that. I hope Ivanka Trump can have some I kind of I was just going to talk about some of the stupid things Trump has been saying about wind power. Oh, well, I'll it, let you guys look it up yourself. It's, yeah, it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's too expensive. What? It's, they're really? unreliable. Half of them are broken. Yeah, they're rusting this, and rotting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you. There Fossil are people. Isors. People in in corporate America are going to spend millions and millions and you know, some of these wind projects spend, cost well upwards of a billion dollars. Yeah, if you're a corporate buyer, are you going to buy a wind project for a billion dollars? That's rusting and rotting. Without <laughs> without checking. To, to see what the warranty is on the on the I turbines. Don't think so. If you were General Electric, yeah. would you would you provide a wind turbine with a 25 year warranty when it's going to self destruct in six years? Of course not. There are a lot of lies out there. Absolutely. I'm going to say absolutely lies. Absolutely. There are a lot of them, and if you believe these bad things about wind power, you should look up what the truth is because they are lies. <laughs> it, it's astonishing because the correct information is out there and there are people out there who, I don't know who pays them, maybe nobody does and they just get a thrill out of pushing other people around. Anyway. Well, here's, here's a, a wind power picture that's very interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, this is an important one too. G Captain. It makes my eyes hurt to see yeah, that we, picture. We've shown a lot of wind power <laughs> pictures on this show. Yeah. But this one is particularly interesting because it is local. But it shines in my eyes. It, it <laughs> <laughs> what's this the, is Block Island. Yeah. What's the title of the article? Uh, hmm. Statoil wins offshore wind lease off New York. Yeah. This, this is, is just not adjacent to this Block Island. No. It's a little bit. This is a different one, Tom, I think. No, it's adjacent to it. It's further closer to New York. No, 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 no. This, there, is one, there is one that is west of Block Island, and it's almost the same size as this, but this one is south of New York City. South of New York. Okay, that's a different, different this place. This is a there. different one. Norwegian energy giant Statoil um, was declared the provisional winner of the U.S. government's wind lease sale of 79,350 acres in waters off New York, Statoil had sub submitted the winning bid of $42,469,725 in the online offshore wind, online offshore, that's a good term, wind auction conducted by the U.S. DOE's um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, I know there was one off New York City. I hope I haven't d misled poor Tom here and everybody else by saying that this I is I think the you're one. right. I think this is out in the Atlantic, south, <coughs> south of Long Island. <coughs> yeah. It's off <coughs> like Fire Island and that area there. Okay. And it's 125 square miles. So that's fairly large. So, and Statoil is a good bidder for this because they know what they're doing. They, they've done this before. Yes. Yeah. They have the experience. Yep. Okay. 
They're talking about more than a gigawatt of wind out of this. Yes. <laughs> Our next wind. item is from... That's v more hot air than you get on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Our next item is from VT Digger, which will tell you that it's from Vermont. Yeah, this is a good one. Burlington Electric continues focus on 100% renewability with the addition of more wind energy. Now, this is interesting to me partly because there's a number of cities that are getting to 100% renewable power, and, you, and I see these headlines that are saying, and, and they're getting this, and they're getting this. Well, Burlington's had this for a long time. Burlington's been 100% uh, uh, electric, uh, renewable electric for a long time, but they're, they're just switching us to a different source. Well, they're in, trying to guarantee they can keep doing it. Yep. In Vermont, Burlington Electric Department continues to focus on sourcing 100% of its power from renewable generation with the addition of a new source of, to its power portfolio. Maine's 17-turbine Hancock Wind Project began operating commercially on December 16th, and it will supply 9% of Burlington's energy needs. So uh, they, they have purchased part of this wind farm. They, yeah. they don't own the whole thing, uh, about a quarter of it. So they've purchased about a quarter of their production. Yeah. And uh, there isn't much more to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's move on to December 18th then. Okay. And this is okay, from we got Think a, we got a Geo here. Energy. Yes. Let's see if we can get the picture up. Oh, there it is. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and that, in, to, in, in case anybody sees it and says, wait a minute, is that, is that? Yes, that is the Hag so Hagia Sophia in the background. There. Yeah, this is Istanbul. Istanbul. Turkey to cut back on energy importance, energy imports with renewable energy power generation. But the kind of renewable that they're talking about is very interesting. Yeah. I'll leave it to yeah. you. Turkey will focus its efforts on local renewable energy projects to cut back on costly imports of up to $40 billion annually for energy. Geothermal energy projects will play a part of that. The Energy and Natural Resources Minister said Turkey will focus on more more on domestic and renewable energy investments in the future. Geothermal. So they got a lot of geothermal in Turkey. They have a lot of earthquakes, and the two of them seem to go yeah, together. Yeah, they're, they're connected. Maybe yep. they could get geothermal in Oklahoma now. <laughs> By the way, I was looking at this picture. I'm going to pull the picture yeah. up again, you know, and I don't normally think of Istanbul being a seaport. Oh. <laughs> but it is. Yeah. It's, it's on this strait called the Bosphorus. <coughs> yes. Which connects ultimately the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. That's right. It's one of the most heavily well, traveled Constan waterways in the world. Ca Constantinople was one of the most important ports, ports in oh, the world absolutely. during the Roman times. For a thousand years. Istanbul is the Turkish um, uh, pronunciation for Constantinople. Correct. Is Which used to be named after Constantine. That's right. <laughs> it's kind of like the uh, Hawaiian word for, for uh, in, in Hawaiian, if you want to say, do you speak English, you say, e olilu pelikani ani Okay. <laughs> pelikani is it's English. English huh? I thought to myself, how, how can pelikani be English? <laughs> pelikani is their attempt using the, the, the letters in their alphabet. There's only about 14, isn't it? Something 13, like that? 13, 13, including yeah. a glottal stop. Um, a glottal stop. A glottal stop, that's right. <laughs> um, it's their attempt to say Britain, Pelicani. Is it really? Yes. Britain, huh? That's English. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Mele Kalikimaka is Merry Christmas. Okay. <laughs> I get the Mele, Mele part. <laughs> Mele Kalikimaka is Christmas. Okay. It's really yeah, hard yeah. to, to Tr move those sounds around. Yeah, yeah. And Hawaiian has such a small number of sounds that um, it, they, they really have to stretch reality to get <laughs> to talk about Britain or Christmas. But Istanbul is not too bad an attempt at when Constantinople. I was in Saudi Arabia, I had a Turkish friend named Babur. Yes. And he showed me once where he came from on the map, which was the European part of Turkey. Yeah. Right next to Istanbul. Yeah. And I said to him, hell, you don't live in Istanbul, you live in West Istanbul. <laughs> I don't think he ever figured out what I was trying to tell him. <laughs> okay, let's get back to Vermont. Let's get back to... Ah, we are back in Vermont. That's right. Okay, let's get uh, Istanbul or West Istanbul or whatever. This item came from VT Digger again. 
Green Mountain Power and Virtual Peaker, which is the name of a company, announced partnership to help customers save money and reduce emissions. This Vir is an important program. Yeah. It's a pilot program It's now. a pilot program. It's a very small company. V Vermont Utility Green Mountain Power will partner with Virtual Peaker, Inc. to help customers save money, reduce carbon emissions, and use more renewables. V GMP will use proprietary software by Virtual Peaker that shares access to internet-based applications and services devices so they can be managed to even out grid demand. Now, I've, I've got to interview these people and write an article for Green Energy Times. I think this is going to be an interesting thing to this do. This is very interesting. I mean, they're using smart appliances. Yep. They're using, what is it they call it? The Internet of Things. The Internet of Things. To, a, and a, with the customer's permission, yeah. they are using these washing machines and dryers and perfect example of this. We, in, the, in the building that I live in, we have a single water heater. It is a 105-gallon uh, marathon heater, which has got about, I don't know, four-inch insulation, which is uh, foam, foam plastic. Okay. And it's extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. But even so, what that means is that if you turn that thing on at midnight and then turn it off again as when it reaches temperature and don't turn it on until the following midnight, chances are you're going to have all the hot water you need for the whole day. Yeah, unless you've okay. got a teenager. So what happens, even a teenager, <laughs> you'd, have, you'd have a little difficulty with this one. I mean, at, at, using showers that run a gallon and a half a minute, it's going to take 40 minutes to run that while well, you're a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, if you have software that says, I want you to turn on when the demand is low and stay on until you're up to temperature or the, until the demand gets high to that particular device, it means it never goes on during the daytime. It never goes on when demand is high. It's not having a really simple thing there that just turns it on in, in off-peak off hours. And the result of that is that it's almost like having a battery. Absolutely. At yeah. no cost except for the fact that you've got a smart box in there that will communicate well, this, with the internet. This is pushing the envelope. Yeah. Really it is. And we saw that they, well we've talked to some of the people that were their first uh, people using this. Yeah. About a dozen maybe, half a dozen. Yeah. But now this is a, a pilot program involving maybe a thousand people. Yeah. And if that works out, and I think it will, you know, they're going to extend it system-wide. Yes, they will. That's certainly their plan. Yep. We are a little behind schedule here. We're, we do this every week. <laughs> Our next item is Monday, December 19th. It's the, from the American Prospect. Interesting, interesting take on this. Will big business help fight Trump's anti-environment agenda? You see, the Republicans who are pro-business, no. Sorry, Trump isn't pro-business. <laughs> He's pro-oil. Yeah. Will um, U.S. environmentalists still have hope, though, the public, though their pu public protests may fall on deaf, deaf ears, as long as Trump is in the White House and Republicans control Congress, environmental activists may find more of an audience in corporate boardrooms. And that's just the way it is. Because the bottom line is what counts. Yeah. The, the climate change is extremely expensive. Stopping it is cheaper. Okay, should we continue? You can find that out. You can look it up on by going to December 19th on the geoharvey.com. Um, the American Prospect. That's the source. Yes, The yeah. American Prospect. Click on Our that. next item is on Tribune Review. Well, this is from brilliant. The Tribune Review. <laughs> this is brilliant. Engineers find hydroelectric, poten hydroelectric potential in centuries-old New York mine. And it is centuries-old. This mine produced cannonballs for Fort Ticon Ticonderoga in the Revolutionary <laughs> War. An ambitious group of engineers sees value in abandoned, abandoned shafts of, of a century-old iron mine in New York's Adirondacks. They say the mine can provide a steady flow of electricity in a growing renewable energy market. They have a plan to use the millions of gallons of, under, uh, of groundwater that have flooded the mine for energy storage. So they flooded the shafts. They're going to pump them out of the shafts up into the main area, whatever you call it. Reservoir. 
Many, which yeah. will be underground. Yeah. Okay, and then they're going to run them back down the, sh the shaft. Yeah. It's all underground. It's all clean. All. Nobody even knows it's there. Yeah. <laughs> it's all out of sight. I, uh, I really uh, want to watch this and see how it develops because it sounds like a, a very good use of old stuff, old mines. Old abandoned mine, old abandoned yeah. Old abandoned mines. Our next item, this is, uh, next item is from Tuesday, December 20th. Okay. It's from PV Magazine USA. Picture and here. this is the one that we had trouble with, wasn't it, Tom? Yes, I couldn't and open this one up. I, this, was a, <laughs> this was very peculiar. Tom sent me an, uh, a, an email saying I couldn't open that file. I, I went back and I couldn't. To it. I couldn't open it. I just, yeah. I just had it. Just had a thing saying cannot open this site. Yeah. So I went to another site that I knew had the same information, which is Clean Technica that we do use all the time, and I got the same message from them. And their thing was not a copy of this. But then I went online and I found yes, which you did information find. is yeah. still there. It's just that it had become, I don't know, but uh, have, well, have I, you have... I got the headline from the new source. From the new it's source, basically okay. Basically saying the same thing. Yeah. Solar is the top source of new capacity in the U.S. grid in 2016. We all and knew... That's what that picture is yep, showing. Yep, we all knew that 2016 was going to be a very good year for the U.S. solar market. However, no one could say exactly how good. Now, the DOE's Energy Information Administration posted some of the first concrete numbers of the year. The EIA estimates that the United States will have installed 9.5 gigawatts of utility-scale solar in, in 2016. Now, 9.5 gigawatts, where natural gas is 8 gigawatts, and I want to point out, 9.5 gigawatts is just solar. We've and got it's, and it's just a commercial and scale it's solar. just utility yeah. scale and forty percent of the solar that goes up is usually uh, distributed, which means On that people's rooftops. We may have we may have actually gone past fifty percent of the of the electric new growth new, new growth yeah. in electric generation capacity being solar, and then number three was wind. Um, we did have one point one gigawatts of nuclear. Fair amount of wind too. A fair amount of wind, yeah. This graph is interesting. Yeah, it's huge. Well, December is almost always a big month for wind and solar. Um, and the natural gas tends to come online in the spring and summer. I don't know why, but it does. We should move on. Well, that, a quick takeaway oh, here. Oh, yeah, okay. The changing economics of renewables may make President-elect Trump's decision to pack his cabinet with fossil fuel fans. Irrelevant. <laughs> it's going to make it relevant to them because they're going to be laughed at. <laughs> okay, our our um, next item is from we got CNN. Here too. And this is truly distressing. Isn't that something? Yeah. China smog. Red alert shuts down factories and schools. Red alert is bad. It's bad. A dangerous gray haze descended on northeast China over the weekend, choking off schools, flights, and industry. China saw the smog coming and last week issued the first red alert, red alert of the year for 23 cities. The smog covered an area of 10.1 million square kilometers, which is 3.9 million square miles, roughly the size of the United States. And you know, there's that's a lot of smog. That's a lot of smog. And it makes me wonder about this because China is smaller than the United States. So they're saying in northeast China, there's an area of almost the size of the United States that got shut down. And I don't know where the, and I have to tell China you. China is smaller than the United States? China is slightly smaller than the United States. Surprised me. Yeah. <laughs> it looks bigger than that on the map. But. Well, they're, they're very similar in size. Yeah. But even if they were exactly, even if China were slightly larger than the United States, still saying you've got an area in this country that's the size of the United States that's in its northeast um, doesn't sound true to me. And I'm not sure what went wrong. This is a very widely publicized factoid, if it's a factoid. And uh, factoid meaning something that sounds like it's a fact, but it isn't. Um, I don't know what to make of this, but this smog is horribly, horribly bad. And this picture we see is not the worst case of the smog no, in China. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, their air quality score cuts off at 500. Yeah, and they... And this was measured at 800. Yeah. Wow. This is really bad. Well, 
uh, I'll give you a quick takeaway here. Okay. The situation is so dire that it's created a, sp a spate of smog refugees who are fleeing Beijing for cleaner air to the south. Yeah. Okay, we have to move on. Our next item is from the Worcester Telegram. Massachusetts issues draft of clean air regs. With, Hearing scheduled. With Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker describing climate change as a, quote, serious threat, end quote, the state's Clean Air Energy unveiled Agency unveiled draft regulations aimed at securing greenhouse gas emission reductions from the natural gas, transportation, and electricity generation industries. Regulations will be vetted in a series of public hearings. That well, is Massachusetts is serious about this. Yeah, that's in 2008, they passed a law requiring the state <coughs> to achieve greenhouse gas reductions of 25% below 1990, yeah, and they have to do it by 2020. Yeah, this That's is coming close. right up. Um, that was on December 20th. Our next item is on Wednesday, December, December 21st. 21st. And we have a picture for this oh, one. Oh yeah, this is, this is one of those machines. But, one of uh, those specialized we, machines. This we're is both from, fascinated by these Yeah, machines. I know. This is from St. Louis Today, sdltoday.com. Obama bans future oil leases in much of the Arctic and Atlantic. President Barack Obama designated the bulk of U.S. waters in the Arctic Ocean and also certain areas in the Atlantic Ocean as indefinitely off-limits to future oil and gas leasing. The White House said the wording of the statute allowed the ban, allowing the ban provides no authority for subsequent presidents to undo permanent withdrawals. Which that was means kind of sneaky. Yeah, which means that if <laughs> Donald Trump wants to undo this, he's going to have to get he's, Congress to work on it. He's going to have a hard time. He's going to have a hard time. Interesting takeaway from this one. I'll, I'll, it's two sentences. The president of the South Carolina Small Business Chamber of Commerce in Columbia said he was extremely disappointed in the decision not to extend drilling protections to the entire Atlantic seaboard. How about that? That surprised me, but there's a reason behind it. Uh, tourism. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh huh. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, we got one. We got an interesting. We we've talked this, about this, this already. This particular article is the second this week, which is the two of them together. Yeah, we talked are just about it last week. Unbelievable. This is a biggie. This is from Wonderground.com. Rapid ice melt in East Antarctica, Antarctica, could lead to 11 foot rise in global sea level. Scientists say. Right. Warm water flowing think about through. 11 feet and 11 think about feet. coastal cities. Yeah. Warm water flowing through a deep channel under East Antarctica's largest glacier is driving rapid melting. A study published in the journal Science Advances says it says that if the thinning continues, which it will, the massive uh, shelf gives way. Now, this is not just slowly moving into the sea, this is giving way. Enough and ice allowing new glaciers to move out into yeah. the sea. Yeah, enough ice could slide into the sea to ra raise global levels by over 11 feet. And I got news for you: at over 11 feet, there ain't no way you're going to preserve Miami. Well, I'm just going to say this: more than half of the area of 40 large cities, <coughs> including New York City, Virginia Beach, and Miami is less than 10 feet above the tide line. Amazing. Well, what's a high point of Florida? Something like 30 feet above sea No, level? It's, it's higher than that, but it's, you it's know. Not very, not it's very not very much high. high, no. No. It isn't. And, and already it, Miami Beach is getting warm weather flooding. Yeah. In other words, Miami is already at past, Miami is already past the limit of what it can endure. If you, without action, if you are uh, driving a car in Miami, you drive through salt water uh, every time you have what's called a spring tide. Spring which tide, yes. Yeah. High tide. High tide. High tide. At, high tide. Yeah, it's, it's high tide at the new or full moon. Yeah. <coughs> and driving through salt water is not good for cars. I don't think so. Just not good for cars. <laughs> I don't think so. And 11 feet more than that? Well, <laughs> sorry. They're spending a, half a billion dollars raising the roads. But how much are they raising them for? It isn't 11 feet. It isn't even a third of 11 feet. And they can't keep doing it forever. They can't keep doing it forever. 
you know, we are we're in... We're talking about Miami Beach. There's all those other towns around, Hollywood. Yeah, and, and you know who else is going to be in trouble is Donald Trump, who's got this beachfront property down there that he uses for a hotel. Sorry, Donald. <laughs> You're between the rock and the hard place in more, more ways than one. Well, he's got one in Ireland we talked about last week. Yeah. It's right on the ocean. That's right. And, you know, I mean, London, they put in that enormous moving seawall. Yep. It's not going to be high enough for this. No, you're just going to have to build another one. We talked about all of the area of New Orleans outside the New levee Orleans system. New Orleans is gone. Yeah. They can't even save New Orleans. All of the area outside the levees, they're saying, might have to, they were saying, might have to be evacuated in, in the next 20 yep. years. Yep. And I don't think that that evacuation considered this particular, it certainly didn't consider this study because this study wasn't out yet. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what to say, but you Wall know, Street's going to be people too. people being in denial is not helping. No, it's hurting badly. Yeah. It's ironic. Wall Street will be gone. Okay, should we go on to our, our yeah, last this, item this here? This is the last item, and we've talked about and this, this is one fun. already. This this is this is a great article. A lot of pictures. Uh, it's fun. I spent about an hour looking at it. Did you? This, this is, is great. Yeah, I spent quite a while looking at this myself. This is from the Meriden Record Journal. In Meriden, Meriden is down by Waterbury. It's like in the center of the state. Close to it, yeah. yeah. Okay, Ar Archimedes Screw now in place at Hanover Pond in Meriden. Meriden, Connecticut, Connecticut has made history as the first city in the United States to install an Archimedes Screw turbine to generate power at a dam. The 20-ton, 35-foot-long steel screw lifted by a crane into the Hanover Road, uh, Hanover Pond Dam will generate about 900,000 kilowatt hours of electricity annually and is expected to save the city uh, $20,000 a year. <coughs> they must have had some kind of subsidy on this because $20,000 a year is not much uh, money for a uh, thing is expensive. The Archimedes screws turbines oh, are kind I, of expensive. I, I read the article and th yeah, there's a lot of subsidies behind it. Yeah. Um, Queen Elizabeth has two of these. Uh-huh. Uh, they it's, provide it's all the power for Windsor Castle. In, a, in the 19th century, we powered almost everything by water. Yeah. You go down a Holyoke Mass and... It's all water. All, all those mills well, are Well, here in Brattleboro, we have a street called Canal, Canal street. street. Yeah, what was the canal for? The canal was for powering a, uh, 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 a factory down where the I car is. I thought it was for those gondoliers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. That would be an interesting thing, you know, to have gondoliers. <laughs> we could have a, have a, a, a team at the at the Brattleboro Union High School called the Gondoliers. <laughs> <coughs> we could have the Canal Street School Gondoliers. That would yeah, make, that would good. make sense. Well, as you've already told us, fish and other aquatic animals can safely travel through the dam. Yeah. They just they just don't get hurt by this turbine because there's the, the water moves the turbine, but the turbine is not moving through the water. It, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but, it, but it, it works. And there's more than one kind of these. You could actually make one of these at your home if you had a, a piece of pipe and you had some flexible um, tube and you just wrapped the flexible tube around the pipe. You'd uh -huh. have, you'd have, something like you'd that. have a, a, a type of our Archimedes screw. But anyway, this is... Um, this, this, by the way, it's rotating 30 revolutions a minute. So it takes it... Um, That's about... It, One revolution every two seconds. That's right. So it's moving fairly fast. It's moving fairly fast, but you know, it's not. It's not uh, as you said. As I said, the fish go right through it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've run out. out we've of the, run out of time. Uh, we, here. we have run out of things to do, and we will say, have a really lovely week, and we will hope to. Oh, next week we won't have a show. Oh. <laughs> because the station's, stations closed for the entire week. For week yeah. So we're going to have to have a two-week show two weeks from now. Well, we did that a couple of weeks We've ago. done that before. Good See you later. Bye-bye. Gentle rains can fall upon the land So lovely earth can stay lovely still